afternoon. Welcome to the AWS webinar, Learning Windows Workloads on AWS. This is Bill Jacoby coming to you from Worldwide Public Sector. And our topic today is Learning Windows Workloads on, on AWS. If you have questions along the way, please enter them into the chat window and we'll have time for questions at the, at the very end. If you have any audio issues or any logistics issues, please always type them into the chat window and uh, we have moderators for monitoring those windows and we'll try to get to them. Thanks for joining today and let's jump right in. So our agenda is going to be, uh, first of all, a case study on the Amazon corporate migration of Microsoft servers to AWS. I want to do several demonstrations. I'd like to demonstrate running the, running the Windows and Microsoft Office products on AWS. I'll give you a live example of running um, all of the servers at the same time on AWS. Uh, this would be Exchange, SharePoint, um, Link, Active Directory, um, all, running, all running in a single virtual private cloud. And this would be equivalent of you running all the servers on one cloud at once. I'll also talk a bit about cost, licensing, and performance, and uh, and how to license the Microsoft products for AWS. It's easy to license the products. If you run on a platform, I'll talk a bit about performance and latency, and we'll talk about kind of the overall space here, desktop as a service, and what are the things you will need to, to run desktop. Okay, so before I before I actually get into uh, sort of our experience with Amazon running on running the Microsoft servers on AWS. The 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 main and obvious question is why would anyone want to run uh, the Microsoft servers on Amazon? And so I wanted to give a couple general benefits around a couple general answers around what are the cloud benefits for running Microsoft servers on AWS, and then I want to give you on the next slide some specific reasons for running the Microsoft servers on AWS. So in terms of just general cloud benefits, the, the first one is, is just agility. And what I mean by agility is that in the cloud, it's so easy to spin up virtual machines, what we call instances, that you can test adding additional uh, SharePoint web front ends. You can add additional uh, link, front, link front end servers. You can add, you can play around with, with SQL Server failover clusters. Uh, it's so easy to spin up uh, resources, to add new volumes, to change from spinning magnetic disk to SSDs, that you really get a lot of agility and you can optimize and tune your environment based on, based on the, that experimentation and, and that agility. Um, I wouldn't recommend running anything on AWS if it didn't save you money. And so in the case of AWS, we believe you can save lots of money running the Microsoft servers and in particular, you only pay for what you use. And you can turn up and down the Microsoft servers based on demand or based on schedules. So if you know that you need fewer servers running in your, in your uh, environment on weekends or after hours, uh, you can, you can auto-scale down those resources and, and not have to pay for them. Alternatively, you can also, through elasticity, you can also provision additional servers on demand. And so essentially, uh, by monitoring what the, the load on your servers, you can auto scale a greater number of servers, or um, or uh, just manually in the console, you can with a few clicks you can add or remove servers. You can resize servers, so you can go from a four proc server, an eight proc server, to a sixteen proc server, or you can go go lower if you want. So elasticity is a is another great benefit of the cloud in general. Front the functionality. We have released um, many, many services on, on AWS, and we in 2011, we released 80 significant services and features. In 2012, we released about 160. Uh, in 2013, we released 280. In 2014, we released 516. And last year, we, we released 722 new services, um, which is an increase of nearly 40% year over year. So as, a, as our customer, you benefit from continual innovation, iteration, evolution, and you get the latest and greatest features and enhancements instantly. No, no special need to, to upgrade. 
So uh, quite a breadth of functionality. And lastly, you can go global on AWS. So we have 12 regions. We actually announced our 13th region just a few weeks ago in India. So we now have 13 regions across uh, all the continents, um, as you see on this slide here. And we now support 35 availability zones around, around the world. Okay, so those reasons I gave are fairly generic reasons for why running Microsoft servers on, on AWS. But why specifically would you want to run would you want to run these Microsoft servers on uh, on AWS? Not generic benefits, but specific ones. The first one relates to ISV application compatibility and ISV add-ons. And so because we're an infrastructure as a service provider, if you're running internally on your internet, if you're running a DOD records management uh, application on top of SharePoint, you can run that on AWS. If you're running a, an email classification program, auto classification program on, on premise, you can run those kinds of applications on AWS. If you're running, um, if you're running, for example, a customized archive and backup program that archives messages on a certain frequency from certain users with certain keywords, um, you can run any, you can run nearly any ISV application or add-on on AWS and it runs because, because we do essentially mimic uh, the on-premise environment as an IaaS uh, infrastructure as a service platform. Um, we're also enabled for compliance. And so although we won't be talking about some of the standards today that we support, we do have an accelerator for NIST compliance, the accelerator for NIST 800-53 compliance, in which we show that our infrastructure is uh, essentially FedRAMP enabled. Um, and so it becomes very easy to run, run Microsoft and all servers in a, in a compliant way. Uh, you can ensure or, and guarantee and, and audit that you're in compliance with Microsoft licensing. So we have a tool called AWS Config. And AWS Config allows you to monitor the fact that your server-bound licenses remain attached to the servers that you've run them on. And you can show reports to Microsoft or, or your own internal IT department that if Microsoft requires that a server license not move from that server in any less than 90 days, we, we can use our AWS config program to prove that in fact you've been in, in compliance with Microsoft licensing. Auditability is another great reason why to run the Microsoft servers on, on AWS. And so every API call that you make is audited. Every network packet in and out of Amazon is, is audited and, and recorded. Um, all of your, any change that you make to infrastructure, if you add and if you create a new instance and, and start it up, it's audited. If you delete an instance, if you delete a volume, if you delete an internet gateway, if you add any resources. And so we audit everything that you've done, both from an allow and a deny perspective. So, it, so you have great auditability on the, on the AWS platform. Uh, the platform is also DevOps enabled. And I'll talk about this more as I get more into the presentation. But we have, a, we have a service called AWS CloudFormation. And this is a tool that lets you stamp out uh, fully created N-tier applications on AWS. And CloudFormation integrates very well with Microsoft PowerShell. So if you have a set of PowerShell scripts that stand up servers in a particular way, and we provide quick starts that, that, uh, that do have PowerShell, you can stamp out the same configuration for Exchange or SharePoint or Link or SQL Server um, at essentially the push of a button. And I'll show you an example of that as one of the demos in, in today's session. So this is completely DevOps enabled and uh, CloudFormation and PowerShell together are a, are a, a very powerful combination. You can also optimize your infrastructure by monitoring the resources you're using. And if it turns out that you need uh, instances with more CPU, with more memory, with faster IOPS, with faster um, network IO, we have over 35 instance types. And you can resize an instance that's already running, change volumes, change from magnetic to SSDs, change from uh, SSDs to provisioned IOPS, which is a a higher level, a higher enterprise grade of SSDs. 
And so you have, a, you have lots of ability to uh, tweak and tune your Microsoft environment. Okay, so let's um, talk about, uh, let's sort of move from kind of the theoretical and peel the onion back a layer and talk about how um, these Microsoft servers actually run quite well inside Amazon itself. So as you can see on my slide here, we have over 200,000 users who are using Exchange, SharePoint, and Link um, on, the, on the Amazon corporate image across our company globally around the world. And although the diagram is a little bit hard to, um, to read, we have, uh, we've deployed the Microsoft servers in US East and US West, that's the top two, the top two blocks. And we've also, uh, we also are running the uh, Microsoft servers in uh, US West in Dublin and in Asia Pacific. And so we connect all of these servers together over the AWS backbone, over uh, uh, AWS, the AWS backbone and direct connect to connect all of the Amazon offices. And, um, and as my slide says, we support over 200,000 users on 26 exchange servers. We have four servers per availability zone. We have a database availability group architecture for high availability and our users are, are supported globally, world, worldwide. So I wanted to um, sort of jump into an example. And what you're seeing here on the screen is this concept of cloud formation that allows you to uh, condense a set of infrastructure products and end tier application into a, a set of JSON code, that allowing you to uh, run that code at the push of a button. But cloud formation goes beyond simply capturing code as JSON. Using cloud formation, and as you can see in the screen here, we can give you a bi-directional graphical editor that will allow you to add and remove components from any of the servers that, that you see. You can add storage, you can add, you can change the instance type, you can change any, anything about the configuration graphically, and then that'll be updated and reflected in the JSON code or the reverse, you can actually change the, the code that, underlie, that, that makes up the cloud formation template and it'll update the diagram that you're seeing on the screen here. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to show you uh, what this looks like in, um, in cloud formation. Uh, this will be the, uh, this is a diagram that I just brought up a second ago. And you'll notice on the screen here, I can change and move and modify um, the domain controller for SharePoint or um, a, a wait condition that I have. I can adjust and look at greater or lesser amounts of lesser amounts of uh, servers that we have running. You can see the actual code that I have running down here in the JSON as well. And so I just wanted you to see that this is um, that we have this ability to to uh, this DevOps ability. And now let's actually launch the stack, and then we'll come back to that in, in a few minutes. So I'm going to um, launch a stack for SharePoint. And this is the designer that we just now looked at. I'm walking through essentially a wizard to allow me to run a cloud formation template. I'm going to call this uh, SharePoint uh, for, for today's webinar. And we'll run this in, uh, in a region. Uh, we'll, we'll pick an instance type. And uh, let me go ahead and select a key pair name. And just for the sake of just for the sake of this demo, we're going to run this out. Of, we're going to allow access to this this template from any IP address on the internet. Um, so let's go ahead and continue this wizard. This is just simply kicking off SharePoint, and I'm going to name this uh, SharePoint Webinar. Okay, and I'm going to pick a single option that says rollback on failure, no, so that if there are any, I don't think anything will fail, but if there are any failures, we could look at what actually got created. Okay, and that's basically the end of the wizard. I'm going to go ahead and just say, let's go ahead and kick off and, and load and run this, uh, let's go ahead and load and run this, this SharePoint um, stack that, that I just created. Okay, so you'll notice here, uh, create in progress. 
and you'll notice that the time here was created at uh, 414, 414 uh, Pacific time, 414 Eastern time. And uh, we'll come back to this in a few minutes when, it, when it's actually finished running. You can see as I run this, you can see everything that happens. And so uh, you can see the stack, you can see the security groups that are created, you can see instances, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we'll come back to that. I wanted to show a live demo of creating one of the servers uh, as, as part of this, um, as just one of several demonstrations. Now, what, what's actually more interesting for most customers is just like what happened on the client side a few years ago, Microsoft tends to talk about the Microsoft servers as a unit in which all the servers come together to create an integrated experience. And so we've released an enterprise accelerator called Microsoft Servers on the AWS cloud. And this allows you to run Exchange, SharePoint, Link, uh, SQL Server. SharePoint is using SQL Server and Active Directory. Everything is loaded um, in a single uh, set of CloudFormation stacks that allow you to run all the servers at, um, at, the, at the push of a button, walking through the same kind of wizard that I, that I just walked you through. Um, on my last slide in resources, you'll have a larger, uh, a larger copy of the URL, and you'll be able to click on that if you want to run that or, or look at the deployment guide. So when we run the Enterprise Accelerator for Microsoft servers, what we'll be standing up is what you see in the diagram here. What we'll be standing up is essentially, uh, essentially a connection to the remote users. The connection to the remote users I've got it depicted over VPN or Direct Connect. Direct Connect is a private connection between a data center and AWS uh, that doesn't use the internet. VPN would create an encrypted tunnel between your on-premises data center and AWS. Um, and in either event, you can have your users connecting to the AWS cloud. The AWS cloud has really a, a, a management subnet for the remote desktop gateway so that you can RDP into a bastion host or a, or a, a remote desktop gateway host, which becomes your management point for jumping into Exchange or Link or SharePoint or SQL or um, the domain controller. And you'll notice, on, you'll notice on the slide here, I've listed all the IP addresses of the servers. You'll see that this matches the servers that are up and running. And this is all created for you when you run CloudFormation, uh, when you run this uh, Enterprise Accelerator on, on the link at the bottom. You'll also notice that I'm running these servers in two availability zones, Availability Zone 1 and Availability Zone 2, which means that should there be an outage in one of our availability zones, one of our uh, facilities that's part of our regions, should an, an entire availability zone fail, we can fail over through the load balancer to our second availability zone. And we have regions that have up to five availability zones. All of our regions have at least two availability zones. And this gives you the ability to run the Microsoft servers in a very, in a very uh, highly available fashion. I'll talk about performance in, in just a few minutes. But this is the overall architecture for, uh, for what we're running. So I wanted to... Um, so while SharePoint is building in the background, I wanted to show you a quick example of what it looks like to see the clients actually running. So what I've done for this demo is I'd set up two laptops, and um, and the two laptops are just gonna just gonna take part in a standard exchange of um, information between the Microsoft products. And it's a little bit hard to see the screen here, but let me go ahead and hit play, and what you'll see, and I may fast forward this just a tiny bit. Um, what's interesting about this is that the clients were set up in Washington, DC, um, more specifically the Herndon office that I'm sitting in right now. And these clients, these two physical laptops were set up here in Herndon, Virginia. And I'm connecting to servers, which you'll see in a second when I go to the, when I go to the console. The servers are, are, uh, have been stood up in our uh, US West 2 region in Portland. So I'm sending emails, this user on the right is sending emails to another user uh, in Herndon and the server that we're, that we're going through, the exchange servers that we're going through happen to be 2,000 plus miles away in, 
in, uh, like I said, in Portland, Oregon. Okay, so uh, when the user on the left replies, the, the email pops up. Uh, in this case, uh, not only does the email pop, pop up, but uh, we see the presence. So you see the full integration between link and the presence and the Outlook client. So by having clicked on, by having clicked on the user whose presence showed green, the user on the right was able to say essentially, um, Pat Allen is the username. Can I, can I, can I have a quick IM chat with you? And the user on the left, Pat Allen, is saying to Olivia Workman, yes, no problem. Let's, you know, typical, you know, typical things that you would do with, um, with, uh, with Link. Okay, and I'm going to skip ahead just a tiny bit in the demo here because what I want to show you is we also support video. So this is really exciting because remember, I said the servers are available in Portland, Oregon, and what you're seeing on my demo is me, myself, uh, logged in as Pat Allen on the right there. And, um, and if you look, there's very little lag or jitter or uh, hiccups. I don't have the volume running here because there would be uh, lots of feedback, but I want you to be able to see that even 2,000 miles away, using using Direct Connect and the AWS backbone, that even latency sensitive workloads like Link and Skype for Business happen to run really, really well um, when, when they're hosted on AWS. And so the last part of the demo that I want to show you, which sort of completes the, the story of uh, the Microsoft servers, is, is a bit about SharePoint. And so uh, to show you SharePoint here, Let's just skip ahead in the demo a tiny bit. And um, we will, uh, we will uh, jump to, whoops. We will jump to um, where we're showing SharePoint. And then um, just I am here's SharePoint on the left. We have a blog. We have a team site. A number of uh, we have a SharePoint um, document repository and document library. And what's happening now is that what's happening now is that we're going to just I am the link to the other user, and uh, Pat Allen is going to send that link over. And now the user on the right, I think her name was Olive clicked on the link, pulled up the same blog, and, um, and, that, and that really completes the, the Microsoft client aspect of the demos um, across Exchange for email, link for IM and presence, and uh, lastly, SharePoint. OK, so, uh, so, so let's um, hop to the next slide. Okay, so what is it we just saw? Uh, we saw Exchange, SharePoint, Link, SQL Server, and Active Directory all running. They were all deployed from a single master template. Um, I'll talk more about the templates in just a second. You'll also see in just a second when I jump into the console that we that the template kicked off 14 servers across the two availability zones I mentioned. And uh, you'll also see that we have 10,000 users who are part of this, uh, part of this demonstration. The Exchange users are using 5 gig mailboxes. The Link users, as you saw, have video, uh, desktop sharing, um, IM, presence, integration with Outlook, etc. The SharePoint blog and the teammates are, are enabled for everyone. Um, and it costs about $14 an hour to operate these 14 AWS servers. So that's kind of a, su a summary of the solution. And let's peel back the onion a layer deeper and look at uh, and look at what's running on the AWS infrastructure. And so I mentioned, so you see the same servers I showed you earlier. I don't have the IP addresses and all the detail, but we have a single virtual private cloud which is spanning the two availability zones. A virtual private cloud is the network enclave that allows us to set up multiple subnets. A virtual private cloud is an enclave in which you can define multiple subnets. The subnets can live in one or another availability zone. 
Uh, the subnets can be public or private. And the best thing about vir virtual private cloud and subnets is that your applications only need to be aware of subnets. Your applications don't in any way whatsoever need to be aware of AWS constructs like availability zones. We provide high availability and availability zones as kind of a free capability that's grafted onto the fact that we expose subnets through this construct called virtual private clouds. So I mentioned earlier that we have a we have a uh, a DMZ that we a demilitarized zone uh, for management. We have a private subnet for the application servers, so nobody in the internet, none of these users could ever directly access any of the servers. Uh, they this is a completely private subnet, and you can see that by the by the IP address. We have two Active Directory sites. Each Active Directory site also lives in its own availability zone, which means Active Directory is also highly available. We're connected in my example to an on-premise data center here in Herndon, Direct Connect. The quick start that we provide doesn't include Direct Connect, but that's a that's not a difficult add-on once you've once you've set up your your Microsoft uh, your Microsoft demonstration. Okay, and so now uh, let me sort of peel back the Microsoft architecture a little bit more deeply as well. So in the case of Exchange, we're running, uh, in order to provide high availability for Exchange, we're taking advantage of the Microsoft Database Availability Group architecture. And this is an architecture that has multiple databases, multiple mail databases. The mail databases have copies of all the user's mail. You can lose a mail database, and Exchange is smart enough to know to go to another mail database that contains the same information. So you have application level high availability in Microsoft, as well as infrastructure high availability through AWS. Uh, similarly, Microsoft provides high availability through what Microsoft calls link paired pools, which is what we've implemented. So I could lose an entire pool in availability zone one, and go ahead and continue on availability zone two. Um, same thing with SQL Server. I'm using SQL Server always on availability groups for SharePoint. And if I happen to lose my SQL Server uh, master uh, primary replica that you see over here, I'll fail over to my secondary replica that's made automatic on, by Microsoft. Something that's really interesting here is we're using the Microsoft Brick architecture which means that we're using multi-role servers. So if I want to add, if I want to create more than 10,000 users in this example, I can add more Microsoft servers, and each server supports all the roles that would be necessary to add more SharePoint users. I can add more SharePoint web front ends, or Exchange may be a better example in which the mailbox role and the CAS role and the transport role are all consolidated onto the single Exchange server machine. So by simply adding more machine, more, more Exchange instances, more multi-role instances, we can support increments of 10K users. We support about 5K users per, per instance. And so by adding N pods, we can get to N scale. And I also mentioned something else about how we created the solution. So we didn't just create this solution by installing the Microsoft servers willy-nilly. Microsoft has a set of capacity calculators, uh, which they use. You type in, in the case of Exchange, for example, you type in how many users do I have, what is the size of their mailboxes, how many email messages a day do the, does, do the users send on average, um, are the, are, uh, what is the percentage of mail messages that are large, medium, small, what is the average size of an attachment. You fill in all this information in a spreadsheet from Microsoft, and it, it, it outputs an architecture that you ought to implement, a, a, a supportable architecture uh, that Microsoft will, will support. And so by having run the calculators first, that determined how we configured the PowerShell to stand up the Microsoft servers that you, that, uh, that you just saw demonstrated. Okay, so I actually want to do another, I want to do a brief demonstration of the servers themselves. So you saw the clients work, and let's go ahead and um, exit out of the PowerPoint slides for one second. And what I'd like to show you here is a quick demonstration of 
of uh, some of the servers in in action. Okay, so let's um, let's go ahead here, and I'd like to. Uh, this is this is uh, the SharePoint example. By the way, we'll come back to SharePoint, but I just want to point out that the SharePoint example that we kicked off uh, a few minutes ago has created successfully. So we'll test this in in just a minute. But before I before I do, I actually want to jump to I want to jump to um, the example of the Microsoft servers, which you see running here. So I ran these servers on June 13th, and these servers um, you can see that uh, the servers all created successfully. Uh, when I kicked off the master template, it created the AD stack, the Active Directory stack, the Exchange stack, SQL stack, Link stack, and SharePoint stack. You can ignore Docker here. That was something else that I was playing with. And uh, what's interesting here is that uh, Active Directory is the base for everything. Um, there's also some dependencies. I have a slide coming up in which I'll show the dependencies. You have to, for example, load Active Directory first because all the other servers depend on Active Directory. You have to load SQL Server before you load SharePoint because SQL Server depends on SharePoint. You have to load Exchange before you load Link because both Exchange and Link will extend the AD schema. And if they're trying to do so at the same time, you'll end up with a corrupted uh, AD, uh, a corrupted um, Active Directory. Um, uh, uh, deployment. And so there are a number of dependencies in this stack. Take, uh, CloudFormation is able to uh, manage the order in which you run these servers. Okay, so let's actually uh, dive into dive into these servers. These are the actual servers that are up and running. Um, you can see them. You, all, you can see all 14 of the servers that I mentioned earlier. Um, you can see the dom domain controller 1 and domain controller 2. Because everything is running in, in everything is running in pairs because I'm running in in paired availability zones, a pair of remote desktop gateways in two different availability zones. Exchange one and Exchange two are paired together. My SQL Server nodes, Windows Server failover cluster node one and two, are paired together. My Link front end one and Link front end two, my SharePoint app one and two. Um, so this is exactly what you've seen before, but these are all running. Now let's go ahead and actually uh, log into the servers just to just to see what's going on here. So in the Microsoft world, everyone of course uses remote desktop, and let's log in as the administrator. And what this brings up for us. What this? Uh, oh, I'm already I've already uh, remoted in, so I'm only allowed to have a certain number of sessions. So let's uh, so I'm remoted in, and let's take a look at uh, my domain controller one first. And if I slide over the titles here, you'll notice I'm inside of my server called domain controller one. And let's go ahead and um, I think the first thing that I want to show you is is just how many users are actually running. So I'm going to go ahead and run PowerShell. Uh, there's, there's just a, a, you know, just for everything in PowerShell, there's usually a single liner that will um, allow you to uh, run, run PowerShell operations. So in this case, let, let's just uh, look at how many, how many users are actually running in PowerShell. And um, we'll start off with uh, with making sure that we have the PowerShell module loaded, import module, active directory, okay, um, no, no problem. We can say here, uh, get module, and uh, get, a get a list of the modules that are loaded. You'll notice, of course, that the active directory module is, is loaded. Off to the right, for, for those of you who want to learn PowerShell, this is a great script editor, you can look at all the commands that are available um, that relate to anything and everything you'd want to do inside Active Directory. And in, in this case, let's do something you know really simple. Let's, um, let's look at my AD users. I'm going to just hit tab at this point to fill that in. 
And if I want to look at all my users, I'm going to say filter this on essentially nothing, filter star. And what you'll see is quite a lot of users that are scrolling through the screen. Um, we could sit here for a couple minutes and look at 10,000 users. But uh, a slightly more advanced shell command would be to uh, wrap this command, uh, get, get ad user, um, get ad user minus filter star again uh, with a suffix of dot count. And it'll take a couple seconds to, uh, to finish here. But this tells us now that in our demonstration here, we have 10,110 users loaded in Active Directory, including um, our latest example being uh, Vicki Harrington, who has an email ID, who lives in a, in a container, who's part of example.com. And uh, I don't show her email address here, but her email is going to be vharrington at example.com. OK, so I wanted to show you just real quick on the server side, um, just to mention something about performance and latency. If I ping some of these servers, like if I just ping Exchange 1, you'll notice that um, it takes less than one millisecond for me to get a response from a server in my private subnet. Let's do something a little more sophisticated. Let's ping Exchange 2, which is sitting in a different availability zone, a different facility that might be between 50 and 100 miles away from availability zone 1. If I ping, if I ping Exchange 2, you'll notice that our average latency is still less than one millisecond. You'll also notice, by the way, that my IP addresses match what I showed in the diagram on a few, a few slides ago. This is exactly the, you know, sort of we're getting into the, the implementation of how we've made these servers work. Okay, and I, I won't go through all of them, but if I if I wanted to know what it, I can ping, my my front end, my link front end to server, which is also an availability zone two. Again, very fast, very very fast uh, latency. Uh, and I can ping SharePoint as well. Um, and again, same thing, that we're receiving very, very fast uh, results in, in communicating with all these servers. OK, so let's, uh, let's jump from Active Directory and let's do a tiny bit with, um, let's take a look at the other servers to make sure they're up and running. So if I want to look at SharePoint, in the case of SharePoint, this is all sort of old hand for folks who have, um, who have used SharePoint. And let's just take a look at SharePoint Central Admin. And uh, SharePoint Central Admin is, is, of course, how you administer SharePoint. And um, once, I'm, once I'm inside uh, SharePoint Central Admin, um, I just want to highlight the fact that this is the, I, I'm sort of double hopping in. I, I started by remoting into my remote desktop gateway, which had a public address. I'm now, remo I'm now remoted again into my SharePoint web front end server. And if I, if I simply say, hey, let's, um, for example, let's go ahead and manage web applications. Um, we can take a look at the site collections. I'll, I'll pick SharePoint, the, the default one. And if I click on application management here, I can say, let's go ahead and view all my site collections. I won't go through all the details, you know, but this is standard Microsoft stuff. I've got three site collections, a document library. You'll notice the URL document library. It's a, it is a document center. It supports, you know, Windows SharePoint server content. I can look at the blog. I, I'll show you the blog in a second and the team site in a second. And um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to actually create a new site collection here. But if I wanted to, I could just as easily go into application management. And I can say create a site collection. I could fill out this screen. This is, again, pure SharePoint, nothing to do with AWS. And in a few minutes, we would have another site collection. But just to sort of finish the tour, if I jump into Exchange, um, in the case of Exchange, the, uh, if I just jump into uh, Exchange Admin Center here, oops, Exchange Admin Center. You can, you can take a look at uh, all the users that we've got created here and whose mailboxes are mailbox enabled. 
and uh, you know you can see that we have a lot of users here who all have mailboxes if I wanted to create another mailbox from an AD user this is again sort of standard stuff I can browse Active Directory you'll see a whole list of users if I want Allison branch to have a mailbox I can double click on Allison and I can uh, add her alias and uh, go ahead and hit save and I'll, I'll have created a mailbox for, for Allison. So again, this is live, full, the same exchange environment you would use on premise. And the same thing applies as well to link. And so uh, in, the, in the case of link, we'll just uh, we'll jump to the link control, link server control panel, which is how you manage link. We're, uh, we can manage either the front, what, one of the two pools. We can manage the link front end one pool. And um, when I jump into this pool, gosh, there I, I can do I can do anything I want to want to do here. I could enable uh, users for link, and um, for example, here I could say let's let's look at users and enable them for the capabilities that, that happen to be in link. And so again, just like you saw in, in Exchange, I can pick any one of these users. Click, I can click on Alexandra Waters, and I can say, let's go ahead and uh, assign Alexandra to one of the two link pools. I'll pick link front end pool one and, and hit enable, and I've got another, another link user. OK, so that was just meant to be the, the quick tour of the, of the servers. There is actually a point I wanted to make. And I want to jump for a second back to I want to jump for a second back to my remote desktop gateway. So if I uh, so here I'm logged into I'm logged into uh, my remote desktop gateway. This is my my Bastion host or my jump box, and AWS provides very high bandwidth and very low latency networking, both within a region between these availability zones like I showed you with my pings, but we also provide extremely high bandwidth um, between AWS resources. So one of the things that I'd like to do here is I'm going to download a file. I'm looking at S3. I'm looking at a, this is our storage service, our simple storage service uh, that holds objects and files. And just for grins, I'm going to download a one gigabyte file, uh, specifically a 1.2 gigabyte file. And I just want to show you how quick this is on the AWS infrastructure. So when I say download, I'll hit the download button. I'm going to go ahead and notice, do I, I ask the question in Internet Explorer, do I want to save uh, this ISO file, 1.24 gigs? Um, I'm going to go ahead and say uh, yes, save. And watch this quickly because it'll, it'll, it'll download in about five seconds. So when I click on the save button, it, the entire 1.2 gig download uh, just occurred in that amount of time. And you'll notice that, how do, you, how do you know this happened? This happened on August 24th at 4.42 p.m. The 1.2 gig link ISO downloaded that quickly um, into, my, into my remote desktop gateway. So I just wanted to give people um, a comfort level and confidence that our AWS infrastructure is very powerful and able to run the, these Microsoft servers. OK, so let's um, actually jump back to my uh, slides for slides and, and just continue on. And we're, we're nearly done here. You've seen a bit of a tour. I want everyone to know that it's easy to run Microsoft servers on AWS. We have two types of licensing. I'm going to start with my second bullet here, SPLA. SPLA stands for, um, for Service Provider License Agreement. These are uh, servers that we can make available to you on an hourly basis that we are offering uh, with, a, with a price that Microsoft has, uh, has, has asked us to charge on an hourly basis. And we pay, we pay something per hour to Microsoft for running these servers. What that means is that you don't need to bring in your own license. You can run Windows Server. You can run SQL Server 2012, 2014, just a couple weeks ago. We announced SQL Server 2016 is also available. So you can run any of these servers without doing anything special, just clicking on our EC2 launch wizard to run these servers, these Windows and SQL Server uh, versions. 
You can also bring in, if, you've all, if you already have a license agreement or a volume license uh, or enterprise agreement with Microsoft, you can also run uh, Microsoft servers that you already own. So for example, you can, use a, you can bring in, you can bring your own license for Exchange or Link or Skype for Business or SharePoint, um, et cetera, et cetera, System Center. And uh, when you get my deck, this is the page that will allow you to see what is it you need to do. Essentially, all you need to do is create an image, a Hyper-V or, or a VMware image of your Microsoft server and then import it into AWS. And the import process will also, in, will also import uh, your license key. And you'll be fully licensed using BYOL. So you don't need to pay twice for your Microsoft licenses that, that you already own. OK, and um, I wanted to say a word about cost. So I think that, I've, I hope, hopefully, you've seen that these Microsoft servers run really well. The, the clients connect to the servers and run really nicely. When I run this stack, when I run the uh, CloudFormation template to stand up these servers, I have an option, I have a cost option, and by clicking on cost, I can see exactly what it costs to run uh, that configuration. So I loaded uh, 10,000 users into the directory, and my monthly cost for all those users was $9,997, essentially $1 per user per month to run all of these uh, Microsoft users. So a dollar per user per month for all of the servers that I've, that I've been talking about. Uh, so I, I'd like to believe that our prices are, um, are, are reasonable, are, are attractive prices. And generally speaking, you'll see linear scaling in terms of adding more servers to support more users, and your costs will be linear. Your costs won't be completely linear, because some of the servers like SharePoint, or, or I should say SQL Server, can support far more users than 10,000 users. But by adding, more, by adding more SharePoint servers, you don't actually need to add more SQL servers. So the costs are generally linear, but, um, but not exactly linear. OK, so I wanted to actually jump back to, um, I wanted to, jump back to my example of, of SharePoint and um, just to show you that we actually really did build SharePoint. And you actually saw that a second ago. Um, if I jump over here to uh, CloudFormation, uh, this is what we actually built today. And like I said, this was built on uh, 824. We uh, kicked it off at 4.14 PM. And the, no, no, issue, no issue creating this. And if I click over here on, uh, if I click over here on the template, um, you'll, you'll see in just a second the, the template that was run. Oh, it would help if I click over there. You can see this is the actual CloudFormation template. I won't sort of go into the nuts and bolts of what made up the template. I can also click over here on Outputs. And, um, and I can navigate directly to this URL. And, uh, uh, and if I log into the server and get its password, I can log into this URL. I can click on this URL and log into a team site. I think in the interest of time here, I'm not going to do that. I just wanted to, you to see that I've created SharePoint. The resources that have been created are, we've created the uh, SharePoint Foundation, some, a, wait at, some, a security group, um, an IP address. We have an actual instance that got created. Um, these are all the events that took place to get created, the template, the parameters that needed to be filled in. I had to fill in my, my you saw me fill in my key name. And essentially, that created SharePoint, um, you know, in real time here here in this webinar. Okay, and so I want to say a couple more words about this whole notion of DevOps and running things on AWS. Okay, so I've talked uh, I've talked a bit about CloudFormation. That is our service for automating the deployment of resources. And a CloudFormation template is a template that uses this JavaScript object notation to describe the configuration that you want to deploy. By describing, you know, by standing up something in AWS, you can use a tool called CloudFormer that'll condense what you've already run into a JSON file that you can then rerun or modify and configure.
of these JSON documents and capture all the formatting, all the parameters that, that uh, represent your running environment. So uh, when you deploy a, when you deploy a cloud formation, uh, cloud formation, you generally deploy a stack or a, a set of stacks to, to run resources. And as I mentioned earlier, we can slipstream PowerShell into CloudFormation, which allows us to get the best of both worlds. CloudFormation to stand up the AWS infrastructure and PowerShell uh, to stand up and configure the Microsoft servers at the OS level. Okay, and uh, to give you a more specific diagram of these Microsoft servers, it's really just six stacks. And uh, the master stack is what kicked off everything. Like I said earlier, we ran Active Directory. Active Directory stood up the availability zones, the virtual private cloud, the networking, the subnets, um, Route 53, which is our DNS service. Within Active Directory, we set up a domain controller with a global catalog, DNS, um, object replication, et cetera. S same for SQL Server and Exchange Server. I talked about the dependencies earlier, and if you're a Microsoft person, of course, you know, stand up Active Directory first and then stand up the things that depend on Active Directory. And, and similarly, we have dependencies between SharePoint on SQL and Link on Exchange, only in the sense that uh, Exchange needs to extend the, direct, the schema before, before Link does. Okay, so uh, three layers here. And uh, and something that, that you may find interesting is, uh, this is what it actually looks like. So a SQL stack, we can say, for example, don't actually run the SQL stack until we've run the AD stack. And what it looks like in CloudFormation is we have this statement called depends on. And there's a blog post that you'll see on the very last slide that'll give you more information about, about creating these, these uh, CloudFormation templates. Okay, and, um, and just to kind of summarize here, if you, want to, if you want to run a Microsoft environment, if you want to set up desktop as a service, as you can see in my slide here, we fully support Exchange for email and SharePoint for collaboration. I mentioned SharePoint 2013 here. We have a SharePoint 2016 quick start. Um, we, can, we, we support uh, Office Client on, uh, on a regular uh, physical laptop or running on Amazon Workspaces our hosted desktop environment, of course, Active Directory for the directory service, and we can monitor your configuration with uh, infrastructure at the AWS level using a service called CloudWatch and CloudWatch Logs, and at the Microsoft level, we recommend that you run Microsoft System Center to take a look to, to monitor uh, how your environment is running and whether you need to tweak and tune and optimize certain parts of it. Okay, and this is my last slide. It's really all about where do you get these quick starts? We have a quick start for all the individual servers I've talked about today, as well as the quick start for uh, the accelerator for all the Microsoft servers. We have the blog posts I mentioned for how we build this out. And we also have a getting started uh, guide for uh, putting your toe in the water for the first time on getting started with uh, Elastic Compute Cloud and, and Windows. Okay, and with that, I'll, uh, I have time for a few questions.